I don't know if you've ever seen this label on something, a product that was 100% natural, all natural. You see that on a lot of things. A lot of products are advertised as all natural. And this seal is actually certifying that they use all natural ingredients. Uh, I've seen that on hair care products, skin care products, even deodorants. I believe that for me, at least, I want my deodorant to have some chemicals in it. I, I think uh, all natural may not be my best solution there. I saw this, and I'm not sure what to think of all natural Cheetos. I, I, I'm just not sure that that's a, I'm not sure where to go with that. There are all natural insecticides and weed killers and fertilizers, folks. Let me tell you, if you buy all-natural fertilizers, I don't think you want to look at the ingredient. Uh, I, I don't think you want to check the ingredients on that. I, uh, there are a lot of all-natural things that may not be all good. We are in Tornado Alley here, and sometimes all-natural things happen to us. I was... Uh, working with a friend on a wood, wood pile one time, and we saw this all-natural thing. That's not the actual picture I took, because uh, I wasn't going to get close enough to it to take a picture. Uh, I think he stepped on it, to be real, real honest. I, I don't think that's the right thing to do, necessarily, but that's our response. Uh, and uh, I'll tell you what, I've gone to the, the zoo in Omaha several times, and they have that Rattlesnake Canyon thing, and they're behind glass, and they still kind of creep me out. You know, there's like 20 of them behind glass and the rattle. And the, I, even though I know they can't get me, they still, even though I know they're all natural, they still kind of, and I know you don't have to tell me they all, they all have a, a place in the ecosystem and all that, but they're still a little creepy. I, Jenny and I, I think it was just about a year ago, we were down in Florida and uh, we went out to the beach every day to look at this horrible hurricane that was supposed to come ashore as it no I think it might have been two years ago I'm not sure one of the one of the August September times we were down there and this horrible hurricane was supposed to come ashore and it hung out over the Bahamas and basically ruined them but uh, never did come ashore but those things can be I don't know if you ever watched the videos of the all-natural devastation of the uh, tsunami in Japan, but it's, they're scary things. I have all natural headaches that sometimes affect my life. In fact, I'm going to a specialist a week from tomorrow about those and uh, hopefully get some, get some uh, relief from them. The point of all this is all natural does not necessarily mean all wonderful. In fact, when you enter scripture, the word natural actually is a synonym for broken or sinful. The word natural is not a positive word in the New Testament. Because we live in a broken world, sin has corrupted the paradise that God created. And we now live in a world where my nature, my desires and dreams and goals and wishes and ambitions are not cannot be the focus of my life if I want my life to glorify God. I cannot say I'm going to do what I want to do, I'm going to live the way I want to live, and also say I want my life to glorify God. And today as we enter a new section of our study in Galatians, Galatians chapter 5 verses 16 through 26 about walking in the spirit, we see this contrast between the flesh and the Spirit taken very, it's, it's drawn more clearly than it's drawn in other, any other text in the New Testament. Now, a little bit of review. I know you guys love to review, uh, but I think it's important here that we do review. Uh, Galatians chapter 1 and 2, the whole book is about essentially Paul's battle with the Judaizers. You even see that in today's text as he talks about the flesh and the spirit, the circumcision party, those people who said salvation comes by doing the works of the Jewish law, circumcision, Sabbath-keeping, 
other works of the Jewish law. And Paul was fighting them and saying, that is not how someone is saved. He was arguing for salvation by grace through faith. And in Galatians 1 and 2, he gives his personal testimony. How he was saved by God's grace without any works. In fact, he was, he's pretty clear, he was not a good guy. He was fighting the gospel and God saved him. And then how he ministered God's grace without any involvement or cooperation from the Jerusalem apostles. In Galatians 3 and 4, we looked at the doctrine, Paul's theology, if you will. Uh, he talked about how the just will live by faith. This has been foundational to Christian theology. He was saying no to the Judaizers. We are not saved by some combination of believing in God trusting in Christ and our own works. I've used the illustration several times of a nice cold glass of pure water and you put just a little touch of poison in it. How much poison will you put in there before you won't drink it? We don't want any poison in our water. And Paul is saying the pure water of the gospel needs no poison of works. No religion, no religious rituals, none of that. It is salvation by grace through faith alone. And, uh, and he spent two chapters developing that doctrine from all sorts of different perspectives. Now in Galatians 5 and 6, we see the application of that idea. And in Galatians, the first 15 verses, what we've been looking at, Paul is talking about the freedom that we have in Christ. And last week in verses 13 through 15, he said, now listen, the freedom that we have in Christ is wonderful, but remember that our freedom in Christ is not an opportunity to indulge the flesh. Just because we're free in Christ doesn't mean that we're free to do anything we want. And he picks that up, and in verses 16 through 26, he develops that with this long discussion of the flesh and the spirit. Now today we're only going to focus on verses 16 through 18. But I want to introduce the whole passage. Uh, we're going to look just at verses 16 through 18, but I want you to know what's coming up in verses 20, uh, 16 through 26. There's several background principles that we'll look at today, and then hopefully next week we'll get started. And I don't know how in depth I'm going to go into this because less than two years ago, when I was preaching on the Holy Spirit, we took a fairly in-depth look at this. So I, I don't know exactly how deep I want to go into it again. We're at least going to look at it in summary form. The contrast between the works of the flesh, which are our natural condition, the way we live just because we've been born as human beings. The, the way our, it's our natural human condition. And then he says, he says that, that's obvious. That's an obvious way to live anger and enmity and hostility and immorality and all these things those are natural but then he says the fruit of the spirit the way that god's spirit works in you that's love joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness meekness temperance self-control i'm not sure i got them all there but i got close I, that's how the Spirit works in you, the supernatural work of God. And then he closes with uh, three admonitions in the last three verses. I want to go ahead and read the entire text. I don't normally read, and I won't again as we go through it, but I want to read the entire text to you. I, I think it's a healthy thing for us to do at this point. Paul says, I would say then, walk by the Spirit, and you will certainly not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is against the spirit, the spirit desires what is against the flesh. This is the conflict that we're in. These are opposed to each other so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery, hatreds strife jealousy outbursts of anger selfish ambitions dissensions factions envy drunkenness carousing and anything similar these are the things that the the flesh produces in us the desire for these things 
and the actions of these things come from the flesh. They're natural. I'm warning you about these things as I warned you before that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. These are natural works, not the works of a saved person, even though very often saved people act this way. But he says, sorry I didn't click, but he says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The law is not against such things. You, you know, there's no law that prohibits these kinds of behaviors. Now, he says in verse 26, uh, verse 24, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. So what I want you to see today is perspectives on this conflict between the flesh and the spirit i think if you are a believer in christ if you truly have faith in jesus christ you know that there is this struggle most of us realize that we are not what we ought to be what i am i've been a christian now for I mean, I'm closer to 60 years than I am to 55 years. Well, I'm close. I'm moving up. I'm 56 or 57 years I've been a Christian. It's a long time. And I look at that and I think, I should be so, I mean, I should be so holy that my head glows. There should be just a halo floating around my head after that many years as a Christian. Don't you think? <clears throat> But what I am and what I ought to be just don't always match up. I still see so much of the works of the flesh in my life. Those things still pop up. They're still there. And I think, why haven't I made, <clears throat> made more progress? And there's several ways that we can respond to this problem. Some people have said, well, what we need to do, and this was really what the Judaizers did in Judaism, uh, they basically said, well, it's really hard to please God. So what we'll do is we'll make a set of rules that you can follow. And if you'll just follow our rules, we'll assume that God is pleased. So, and, you know, there, there was volumes that actually got really complicated because they started out with the two commandments, love, Lord, your God with all your heart and soul and mind, strength, and the second commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. And God built 10 commandments on that. And then there were 613. I, again, I didn't count those. Somebody else counted them. But it's a pretty standard number of other laws in the Old Testament. And then there are volumes of rabbinic laws built on that. The Bible says it rest on the Sabbath. The Jewish rabbis had volumes of laws. You could take I don't know the exact number, but you can take like 1,012 steps on the Sabbath. Fine. If you took 1,013, you'd broken the Sabbath. So what they would do is they would, on the day before the Sabbath, they would take a chair from their house and they would put it 1,012 steps away. So then they could go to that chair and that was their house and they could take another 1,012 steps from there if they wanted to go somewhere. So there were all these rules, and they had all, you know, Jesus even talked about that. He said, you have rules, but you find ways of getting around them. Rules about tithes, but you find ways of getting around them. You, you, you find ways of, of circumventing all of God's laws. Uh, that is the false gospel of works. you got to find a way to follow a bunch of rules to make God happy. Some people today have developed this twisted gospel of grace that says, God loves me just the way I am, so I can do anything I want. God loves me as I am, so it doesn't matter how I live. God loves me as I am, so whatever I am and whatever I do must be okay with God. And that is a twisted theology of self-fulfillment and a misunderstanding of the gospel. Some people just give up in frustration. There's no way I can please God, why bother trying? So the question is, how can sinful people like me and you, 
who fall short of the glory of God on a daily basis, how can we live lives that are pleasing to God? Now, I need to go back to last week's message, and I know that my messages from week to week stay absolutely fresh in your mind. Amen? Okay. <clears throat> but last week, I think it was last week, see how fresh they stay in my mind? I showed you a coin and said many of the truths that we teach, there's two truths taught in the Bible that are held in, in conflict with each other. And you can't just take one side of the coin and say, I believe this side, and not take the other side of the coin. Here's one of those two sides of the same coin where you have to understand both sides of the coin. The first answer, and this is really important that you understand this, how do we live to please God? You first of all have to understand you can't please God. Nothing you will ever do will please God. And no matter how good you are, no matter how hard you try, you will never be in your own self pleasing to God. God is pleased with you today because of Jesus Christ who died for your sins. If you are in Christ, God is pleased with you because you're in Christ. He's pleased with you eternally and infinitely. And if I have the best day that I've ever had today, and I just walk in grace, and I live in the power of the Holy Spirit, and I have the best day I've ever had, God loves me because I am in Christ, not because I am so holy. And if I mess up big time today, and if I fail today, God loves me because I am in Christ, because I was saved by the grace of God and included in Christ. Our God's pleasure is not based on me doing this or that or how I live my life. God's pleasure is based on what Jesus Christ has done in us. So that's the first answer the first side of the coin here's the second side though you can't just take one side of that i know people who just take the first side and god is pleased with me in christ so why does it matter how i live i might as well do this or i might as well do that no you can't just take that side of it the second answer is a little bit harder god has placed his spirit in us to remake us to reform us you are God's flip project. You ever watch any of those house flipping programs on TV where they go into this old beat up run down house that looks like it ought to just be burned down and they go in and they tear it out to the studs sometimes replace some of the studs and they rebuild it from the inside out you are God's house flipping project and he puts his Holy Spirit in you as the master contractor who goes to work inside of you and remakes you to look like, act like, be like Jesus Christ. And it is not, it is not, it is not human rules that make you pleas ple that make God pleased with you. And it is not certain cultural norms. God is not pleased with you because you adhere to certain ways of living. God is not pleased with you today because you conform to a certain group. A lot of times we act like, well, if you conform to a social group, a certain political point of view, or a religious group, if you just conform to the group, there is so much pressure to conform in Christianity today. If somebody is a little different, oh, we let them know it. That's not how we behave. There's so many, but it's, God is not pleased by our conformity to social norms or human rules or any of that. He is not pleased because you find yourself or maximize yourself or any of that. That's not what he's about. He's not pleased. Now listen, you've got to understand this. Because these things can be helpful. It is not going to counseling or finding an accountability group that please God. I think 
there are a lot of people that benefit from going to counseling. Some of you have, and if you need it, go. And I think an accountability, a human accountability group can help you where you have friends who keep you on track. I'm not speaking against those things. What I am saying is that the key to pleasing God is not those things. I hear it all the time. Well, you'll never grow in Christ if you don't have an accountability group. Well, that, I'd just like you to show me that in the Bible. What the Bible says, says love one another. There are a lot of one another, so if you want to go there, that is important. But what the Bible says is something different. And it's not even, and you know, after 16 years, I'm coming up on my 16th anniversary here, you know that I am not opposed to sound doctrine. I think it is very important. But there are all sorts of Christians who act like if you just have sound doctrine, everything will be okay. If you just have your doctrinal P's and Q's in order, everything will be okay. And none of these things are how you walk and, and please God on a daily basis. It is by walking in the fullness of the Holy Spirit so that you gradually become more like Jesus Christ. The purpose of your life is not to find yourself or to become part of a group and become like the group. It is to daily become more like Jesus Christ. And that is what this passage is all about. It says, don't walk in the flesh, but instead walk daily in the Spirit. That's what walk in the Spirit means. And so what I want to do now is introduce you to the combatants in this conflict that we see in Galatians uh, 5, 16 through 26, and especially in this passage. In one corner, you have the flesh. Now it's interesting uh, because Paul says in verse 15, walk in the spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh or the lust of the flesh. Now when we hear the term lust of the flesh, we immediately think, okay, this is talking about certain kinds of sin. Moral sin, sexual sin, lust of the flesh. But if you look at the, the co construction here, he says in verse 16, I say then. The then points directly back to verse 15. What did he say in verse 15? If you bite and devour one another, watch out or you will be consumed by one another. I say then, walk in the Spirit and you won't give in to the desires of the flesh. In a sense here, Paul is focusing more on selfishness and division and unkindness than he is on any other sin. Now we tend to make huge deals about certain sins. And we give people a pass on other sins. I've said this before. There are certain sins that if I stand here before you and confess them, I am out of the pulpit. Won't, won't be back next Sunday. And I believe that that is right. I think there are certain sins that I should be out of the pulpit before next Sunday, probably before the end of the sermon. But there are other sins that I can stand here and confess to you, and people will say, yeah, I know, no big deal. We tend to ignore certain sins where the Bible shouts pretty loudly about them, where the Bible makes a pretty big deal about them, we tend to view sins on the basis of two things. How common is the sin? You know, I don't know. I honestly don't know. I don't think we have a lot of murderers here today. Should I ask for a show of hands? Maybe not. But because murder is rare, we think, oh yeah, that's a big sin, because very few people commit it. And because less maybe so than we'd like to think, but 
Adultery is less common. Like I say, maybe if we scratch beneath the surface. Uh, but we tend to look at how common a sin is. Well, how many of you would want to assert here that you've never gossiped or never spoken ill of someone else, never held a grudge against someone else, never been guilty of biting and devouring in a certain context? We all engage in these things, and so we're like, well, you know, it's not, I did it too, don't worry about it. There are sins that the Bible shouts about. As I've been reading it recently, I realized that one of the major issues in the New Testament was racism. It was literally one of the major conflicts in the New Testament and one of the major things that Paul addressed, and we're like, yeah, but, you know, no big deal. Unkindness towards others. We have, I have actually had preachers tell me, yeah, but, you know, Paul addressed these people and Jesus turned over the tables and talked to the Pharisees. So it's, it's not a... Paul was adamant about these things. We make certain things a big deal and whisper about others, and we're not walking in the way of Christ when we do. Look at the two lists next week. We'll do that. Or you can read your Bible and look at the list of the things of the flesh. There are some big sins on that list. But some of those sins of the flesh are things that are pretty common in our world. Envy and jealousy. I, I don't have that list memorized, so I'm finding my way back. Anger. Anger. Ambition. Selfish ambition. Dissension and faction. Strife. All of these things are works of the flesh that are a big deal in Paul's mind. And so we need to understand. Now let's talk about the flesh just a little bit more here. What is the flesh? The word literally refers to our physical bodies. This is my flesh. But Paul is not, and he makes it clear that he is not, and the Bible is not dualistic. Where the spirit, there were, there were dualists in the New Testament time, and they were very strong. Uh, we, when we studied church history on Wednesday nights, we talked about them, that, who, who taught that the, the, the body was evil, and the spirit was good. And so anything physical was automatically evil. And Paul did not teach that. God made the world. He called his creation very good. He made a man and a woman, and he called that creation very good. So the physical world, and even the enjoyment of the physical world, is not evil. But because sin has corrupted the physical world, because... I, sin came into this world this world has been corrupted by sin <clears throat> and is no longer naturally instinctively good anymore and my natural desires I can never trust my heart I can never trust my natural desires the Bible says the proverb says the fool trusts in himself Trust in the Lord with all your heart and then lean on your own understanding. Oops, did I? I saw some head shaking. Did I make a misquote there? Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own common sense, your own understanding, your own ability to discern right from wrong. Don't lean on yourself. And that is a that's not just a couple of verses cherry-picked here and there. That is a common theme from Genesis to Revelation. That we are to lean on God's Word and God's truth and not our own understanding. And, and so the Bible uses the term natural as a synonym for unredeemed or sinful. And this is the one side of us, the flesh, the way that we are made. When, when I, from the moment I'm born, my instincts, my desires, I've said this before, you never have to teach a child to be selfish. You never have to teach a child. I've, children just naturally grow up lying. You don't teach that. Maybe they learn it from their parents, I don't know. But uh, 
I don't know why I looked at you, Josh, when I said that, but because uh, uh, he's sitting there with my grandkids. But, uh, you know, <laughs> these things just are instinctual. They're part of our natural. But then, on the other, in the other corner, we have the Holy Spirit. And the moment that we are saved, the Spirit comes to dwell inside of us, and He works inside of us fighting with the, the, the flesh to teach us the ways of God, convict us of sin, and conform us to Christ. And so the Spirit is working inside of us saying, don't listen to your own desires, but instead walk in the ways of God. And Paul here describes that as a conflict. Spirit, the greatest spiritual warfare it's not between us and demons. It's between us and the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of us. It's between my own natural desires and instincts and the Holy Spirit who dwells in me. And my life is a constant battle between my own nature that still desires sin and the work of the Holy Spirit in me to pull me towards Christ and to conform me to Christ. And every day I have to decide whether I will cede authority in my life and control in my life to the Holy Spirit and cooperate with His rebuild, Reformation Project. Will I let Him flip me to become more like Christ? Or will I insist on doing it my own way? So, we have the combatants, the flesh and the Spirit. Now, Paul in this passage gives us several concerns or you know i i guess i went with concerns because i i don't normally alliterate my points but it worked out pretty well here so here's here's uh four things that i want you to see briefly as we look first of all in uh in in chapter 5 verse 16 we find out that the spirit is our power look what he says in chapter 5 verse 16 i say then walk by the spirit and you will certainly not carry out the desire of the flesh. <clears throat> now what he's doing, once again, you have to see everything in Galatians against the backdrop of Paul's battle with the circumcision party, with the Judaizers. They've been saying, if you would just follow the law, if you would just follow our rules, if you just do things our way, conform to our group, and Paul says no. Follow the grace of God and walk in the Spirit and then... It's not rules, it's not conforming culturally, it's walking in the power of the Holy Spirit under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, and that's how you will find daily victory over the, Holy, a victory over the flesh as you walk in the Holy Spirit. The key to spiritual success is a daily walk in the Spirit. It's only by the Spirit that we can overcome. There's a verse that I love. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4, I preached it some time ago. Uh, I can't remember when, but it's amazing how long a few months ago seems to become. It's, it's been several years now. Time passes quickly. <clears throat> but 2 Corinthians 10, 4 says, the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, or they're not carnal. It's the same basic idea. They we don't fight see that that's the problem that we have we're trying to fight spiritual battles with fleshly weapons well what should we do? well let's organize a protest find me one time where paul said we've got a battle here to fight let's organize a protest now that might work in certain realms in the world but it's not how things are done in the church you don't, you don't, that, that's not how we do it. We have, we, we have weapons of warfare and they're spiritual, not carnal. They're, they're weapons that come from the power of the Holy Spirit in us. And as you read through that passage, they are weapons like love and forgiveness, peace, grace. And they boggle the human mind. They're co completely contrary to what we think well how can that possibly work i don't know but it does when we walk in the power of the holy spirit 
The second truth that we see here, I, we, we know that the only thing that will work, number one, is the power of the, the Holy Spirit, walking in the Spirit. Secondly, the flesh and the Spirit fight. The flesh and the Spirit fight. Now, I'm old enough to, be, to believe that cartoons were better in my day than they are today. Can I get an amen on that from everybody that has gray hair or no hair? Our cartoons were better back in my day. Amen. But I always remember Bugs Bunny would get in a fight with Elmer Fudd or somebody else, and, uh, and he would you know, get blown up or shot or something like that. They were a little violent back then, but, uh, but he would say, I guess you know this means war. Of course you know this. Actually, it says that at the bottom. I don't know what, somehow the picture cut that off. Of course you know this means war. And then whoever he was fighting had trouble. Elmer Fudd got messed up or whatever. Those were good old days. Nostalgia. Look at what verse 17 says. The flesh desires what is against the spirit, and the spirit desires what is against the flesh. These are opposed to each other. When the Holy Spirit takes up residence in your heart, at that moment that you are born again, it happened the moment you were born again, the Holy Spirit took up residence in your heart, and he stood and he squared his feet, and he looked at the flesh, and he said, I guess you know this means war. And your heart, your soul, has been a battleground between your natural tendencies and instincts and the work of the flesh, the work of the flesh, and the work of the Spirit in you, and they cannot, they cannot peacefully coexist the Spirit will not partner with the flesh. And we've tried to make it so that the Spirit of God will be like, well, I just, I just want to make you all you can be. I want to give you your best life now. I don't know why I keep using that phrase, but I just want to make you all, I just want to help you reach your potential. No, the Spirit of God wants to help you find Christ's potential in you. He wants to take you so that you, you, Start living the Christ life in you. That's the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is basically the life of Christ. Christ was love, he was joy, he was peace, he was patience, he was kindness, he was goodness, he was faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If I got those right, that'd be the first time in 40 years of preaching. Don't check me out, because uh, maybe I will when I watch the tape later this week. Watch the tape, see? Watch the uh, video this, later this week. But... Uh, we're like, that's, that's the life of Jesus. That's who Jesus was. And the Holy Spirit wants to, wants to stop the flesh from working powerfully, and he wants to start Jesus working in you. That's what, and there is, a, there is an internal, eternal, infinite conflict, and they cannot peacefully coexist. And the flesh is strong. Look at the last half of verse 15, of verse 17, the part that I didn't read before. Flesh desires what's contrary to the spirit. The spirit desires what's contrary to the flesh. They're opposed to each other, and you don't do what you want. I had a small group leader tell me one time, he said, we always do what we want to do. We always do what we want to do, and I said, Brad, what about the Bible? No, not this Brad. Brad, what about the Bible? And I, said, and I read, I actually read Romans 7 to him, but this passage says the same thing. Romans 7 is Paul's idea of a tongue twister. What I do, I do not want to do. What I want to do, I do not do. And it goes on and on like that. But he says here, you don't do what you want to do. It, it's, it's a constant conflict. And we'll say more about this later, but the simple fact is the works of the flesh are immediate. All you have to do 
to live in the flesh is be born and grow up. They're, they're, they're obvious, they're immediate. But the fruit of the Spirit takes time. A few months ago, I planted some tomatoes. And then I went away to the convention and five of the eight plants died, so I replanted some of them. But they're just now, there's green tomatoes. And I thought about frying some of them, but I did that once and they're horrible. I don't know if you like that movie, but fried green tomatoes are absolutely horrible. I just, I just tried them because I thought, well, I, you know, I might as well. But it, it has been months since I planted, and I didn't even plant seeds. I planted, I bought already growing plants at, at Lowe's. And it's been months, and they're still not ready, maybe in a week or so. I'll have some tomatoes. Because there's a, when you, the fruit doesn't come until after a time. And the Holy Spirit is producing fruit in you. It takes time. Now, I would have thought that after 57 years or whatever it's been for me, that it would have been more, you know, quicker more fruit but there's been fruit and it just takes time it's a process and the the flesh never gives up there is a time in your life listen to me there is a time in your life when the flesh will give up and will stop fighting against the work of the holy spirit in you it's called heaven it happens the moment after either you die or you hear the trumpet sound and you're with Jesus. And immediately at that point, the battle is over and you're free. Up until that moment, the battle will continue to rage. But I give you this word as we close. I, I already gave you that word. <laughs> I give you this word. The Spirit does free us. In the Holy Spirit, being led by the Spirit, we're not under the law. What does he mean by that? Once again, he's going back to the, to the circumcision party, the Judaizers, but what he's saying is we don't need these external rules. We don't need the external law because we have the internal power of God. We have... It may be slow, and you may get frustrated at the process, and you may wonder, why am I not doing better? Why am I not growing faster? Why is my life so messed up? But the Spirit of God doesn't quit on you. I've been ready to quit on God, on myself, a lot of times. But the Spirit of God doesn't allow that. You can't quit on God because the Holy Spirit is going to continue to do the work of God in you until that day you see Jesus face to face, however that happens, until that day. So the question as we close today is simple. <clears throat> is your life marked by the power of the flesh or is it marked by the work of the Spirit? Now, the answer to that is yes. Every one of you who's a believer is going to see some of the power of the flesh and some of the power of the Spirit. So it's not like we're going to have, well, three of you, your life is marked by the power of the flesh, and the rest of you, you're, you're spiritual. You know, we used to kind of teach that. You're either going to be spiritual or carnal, one or the other. It's more of a continuum. The question is, how much are you walking in the Spirit and being transformed, and how much are you living in the flesh and resisting the work of God? This battle will continue until you see Jesus face to face. Every day, you've got to decide. And if you make no decision, essentially you've decided to walk in the flesh. But every day, it's a matter of getting up and saying, I'm going to walk in the Spirit. And if you do that at 7 o'clock in the morning, by 9.30, you probably need to decide again. Because the flesh will never give up until Jesus destroys it fully and completely. Now next week, we'll look at the marks of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. Again, I'm just not sure 
whether I'm going to take a week and do that or three weeks and do that, I, I just don't know. But we're going to look at the, the contrast between the flesh and the spirit and look at the markers in our lives. But the point today is that God, if you are saved, if you're not, you need to be saved today. You need to come and, and, and let the Holy Spirit have your life. But if you are filled, if you are a, a, a Christian today, the Holy Spirit dwells in you. You may have suppressed him, you may have denied him, but he's there. And he will empower you to be all that Christ wants you to be. That's his goal in your life. Let it be your goal. Father in heaven, I pray that we will walk in the Spirit and not submit to the deeds of the flesh. Build in us the work of Christ, the fruit of the Spirit, in Jesus' wonderful, precious, and powerful name we pray. Amen.